Welcome to Cafe of Delights, conversations that enlighten and inspire with me, your host, Gail West. We are at the precipice of one of the most exciting evolutions in human history. From science to spirituality, culture, arts, cutting edge psychotherapies, new economies, and more. We will explore how to create a world where all can thrive. In a series of riveting interviews, you'll have the opportunity to hear from those that are actively working at the edges of local, regional, and global transformation. Join me, your host and author of the book, Money Come Dance With Me, Gail West, to be inspired, delighted, and fit Filled with hope for a new reality. Cafe of Delights starts now. Hello, everyone. I'm Gail West, and you are listening to Cafe of Delights on Transformational Talk Radio. Stay with us for the next hour for an enlightening, inspiring conversation with my guest, Jonathan Salk. Jonathan Salk is the co-author with his father, the late Jonas Salk, of A New Reality, Human Evolution for a Sustainable Future, and a highly respected adult, child, and adolescent psychiatrist. A New Reality was initially released near the, nearly four decades ago and recently rewritten and updated for a new generation. The book provides a startling, fresh message of understanding, perspective, and hope for today's tense and rapidly changing world. Graduate of Stanford University and the University of Southern California School of Medicine, Jonathan completed his training at the UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine, where he is currently assistant clinical professor of psychiatry. He has lectured and taught about the theory and practice of psychiatry and is in full-time private practice as well as a senior fellow of the Design Futures Council. Welcome, Dr. Sock. Thank you. It's great to be here. So I'd like to ask the two questions I'd like to open the show with. And one is, where do you find delight at this time? And what brings you hope? Well, they actually overlap in my case, because I think what brings me delight at this time, despite how difficult things look, is the prospects for our future. I think there is a way out of our current crises that can lead to a world where human beings are more creative, more productive, more healthy um, than at any time in in many centuries. And um, that's both hope and delight rolled in one. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> well, I first met you in 2017 in Chicago uh -huh. when there was a Kickstarter campaign to republish your, the book you wrote with your father. Right. Uh, which I believe was in the 90s, right? Um, it was actually earlier than that. It was published in 1981. Okay. So that's written in the late really 70s, early 81. And I remember at that time, I was so taken by the message of your book, and it is now more relevant than ever before. And honestly, whenever I need a hit of hope for the world, I take this book out and reread it. Um, hmm. And for those of you who are deeply concerned regarding what seems like a deep divide in the world at this time, it is my hope that our conversation will help you see it as an opportunity for something greater. Um, and can I call you Jonathan? Sure, that's great. Okay, great. Um, can you explain how your father's exploration in, into population growth led to a greater exploration in human evolution? Um, sure. My my father, um, my father throughout his life was sort of dedicated to making the world a better place, whether it was through the polio vaccine or the establishment of the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. And in the last third of his life, he really devoted his thinking to the broad picture about human evolution and the, the state of humanity. Um, and in the, that context, one day he was looking at the population growth curve in the in the mid 70s, late 80s, which was showed this gradual increase for many, many centuries, for millennia, really. And then of this striking upturn um, and the spike in population growth. And he looked at that and he thought, this, this can't keep increasing forever. Um, and so it's either going to going to collapse, which would be a terrible outcome, or we're going to level out and reach a plateau. And he looked at that and he and he realized that it assumed a shape that was familiar to him, which he called the sigmoid curve, which is an edge shaped curve. It's a little hard on audio to describe it, but it's a curve that on a graph goes goes up and then reaches a point of transition 
and then curves over and and reaches a plateau. It's like an S curve, right? Like an S curve, exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, he went from there to reason that there was some wisdom in nature and there was some wisdom in, in human beings that in that we can adapt and um, change in order to adapt to a future where we're, we're growth is slowing rather than growth is is accelerating. So how does how does that relate to like human evolution? So we're talking sure. about population growth, but yeah, the book is about the human evolution, right? Right, very much so. And what he looked at that, and he um, saw that the the S curve was actually two curves next to each other, and that one was accelerating growth and one was decelerating growth, mm -hmm. and that we're at a point of transition from the acceleration of growth, of there being no limits, of there being um, ample ample resources, ample waste disposal, um, and accelerating growth to uh, a period of time where there's limitation, where we're gonna be reaching a plateau. And um, he, he reasoned that those two periods in history represent two distinct, what he called epochs. One was this period um, where there, the sky was the limit. We could do anything we wanted, which was true up until the early this century. And then the other uh, a period of time where we are approaching a plateau, growth is slowing, we're reaching equilibrium. And then in those two different phases, very different attitudes and values are predominant. And so he saw us really at a point of inflection or a point of transformation right now in the 20th and 21st centuries from one era of humanity and one era of human evolution to the next. You refer to this as Epic A, uh, the first Epic, right? Uh -huh. And Epic B. Uh, so, uh, so let's go more into how Epic A actually happened. And um, like, I, I, I get that we're kind of in this point of inflection and we're moving mm -hmm. to Epic B, right? Is that what you're trying right, to say? Right. Okay. So I'd like to go more into uh, Epic A and how you see that as unsustainable. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the throughout most of human evolution, the worldwide population was at kind of an equilibrium. And then um, getting into the the 16th, 17th, the, even before, even earlier than that, population began to increase. And then with the advent of changes in technology, in healthcare, in agricultural resources, um, all of these things combined to allow us to sustain a bigger population than ever before. And so that we hit a period of that we've been in for a long time of just unfettered growth. And so Epic A was a time where um, certain values were, were predominant and certain values were reinforced. Those being competition, the, the person who grabs the most gets the most. Right. Um, independence, I, I, I'm only looking out for myself. Right. Um, uh, and also values of, I, we can use as much as we want. We can we can take as much as we want, and we can dispose of, of, of as much as we want. And um, so it was. It's that that series of circumstances led to a time where in Epic A, what was reinforced were were those kind of competitive, independent power um, consumption values. Um, does that make some sense? Yeah. So did it, would you say that it's, I mean, we were talking about the 16th, 17th century and changes in agriculture, but do you think that the industrial revolution really pushed the envelope for that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It was really in the 19th century that, that throughout the 19th century with the industrial revolution, um, that, that really, that combined with changes in healthcare and that combined, um, with uh, changes in, in an agricultural revolution right. in the in the nineteenth and twentieth centuries, changed the whole map of of human existence. Right, right. Um, but a, again, what and 
you know, included in that was, um, you know, was economic systems like capitalism that reinforced and were built on these kinds of behaviors. Mm -hmm. So you think that um, this is really, one of the things you're talking about is a shift of limiting resources, right? Or yes. Into, uh, into that. And it, what we see around us right now is the idea that climate change and, um, you know, we're basically destroying the planet and and we don't have, really don't have a choice, right? We we don't have a Well, we, unfortunately, we, we do have do. a choice. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, one of the things that's interesting about this concept and this idea, Gail, is that um, this is an idea that my, my father had um, and that we worked on in the late 70s, really. Right. Which was a period of time before where people were just beginning to talk about um, environmental issues. People were right. just beginning to talk about our relationship to the earth. Um, and climate change was not on the map. The we hadn't really even had any, we, you know, there weren't serious concerns about, about energy crises. And um, so they, you know, what, what developed was this, this situation, this I, idea that um, we, we could do whatever we wanted or that we could, um, and and the the book in some sense was prescient in a way of what what began to develop, right. and so so now we're at a point where we are approaching limits, and if we don't change our basic values, if we don't change our economic systems, our political systems, the way we relate to each other, it's really a, a global and significant change in um, in in our in our world. I think it's interesting that if I think about um, you're kind of moving into talking about Epic B, but um, a lot of what we see has been um, the Western world attitudes towards we can do whatever we want with the planet. It doesn't matter if, um, as opposed to indigenous values, which is still connected to the earth and, and respect for all beings and respect for creation. Right. And I'm really glad you brought that up because central central to this whole concept is that we as humanity and we as human beings once lived in in conditions of equilibrium and while it wasn't a nirvana while it wasn't a paradise the values and the the ways that people related to each other and to the environment and to nature were entirely different from what's from what we're living today so that there are a whole that that human societies and our, and the way we evolved had, had this intrinsic respect and balance with nature. Mm -hmm. With the development of what we're calling Epic A, this went out the window, and we oh, got yeah. away from it. <laughs> right, a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> um, and um, what we're what we're faced with, and. And that had tremendous advantages. That that helped a lot. The the growth and the the development of modernity had tremendous advantages and um, allowed people to have healthier, longer lived lives than ever before. But it's also had serious consequences, and the consequences are the ones you're, you're talking about. One of the things that we're facing is in order to change to what we're calling epic B values is incorporating some of the old, more indigenous values that have gotten thrown aside. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of central to our, our evolution. In some sense, going back to um, what was successful for us in, in you know, throughout history. Well, let's, um, let's kind of move on to, we kind of got an idea of Epic A. Okay. <laughs> that is pretty um, unsustainable. Um, and so let's move over to just kind of, um, one one of the things you talk about in the book is this idea of um, disruption mm -hmm. that we're in this disruptive phase. Yeah. Um, do you can it, can you talk about that a little bit and how that relates to Epic B? I I can. Let me describe Epic B a little bit first, and then we'll come back and talk about this the disruption of the transition, if that's okay. We're going to take a break in a, in a few minutes. So okay, uh, let's. 
let's kind of um, table that. But I think I'm going to, when we talk about indigenous um, cultures, there is a movement around the world to reconnect to indigenous cultures, which I think Correct. is really positive. Correct. Yeah. And um, and there's a lot of, of um, kind of aching to have something different. Yes. So we're at a point now of real uncertainty about what's going to happen in the what what's going to take place in the future and where we're going to go. And that that's a, a point of, of high conflict of, of values. Right. I think an answer to your, to your question is there's an aching to find some solution to these, to, to look where we can go and look where we can get to. Yeah. We'll talk more about it, but there's a tendency for people to look into the past, um, into the more recent past and say, let's go back to the values that got us here, which is only going to reinforce where we're going. And then yeah. there are other people who are saying, we need to go forward. We need to figure out a new way to adapt in a world where there are limits. And one of the things, and we have a lot we can learn from the indigenous cultures, both in terms, not only in terms of spirituality, but in terms of the kind of political, social, and group and economic organization. Well, there's a saying that um, the, uh, that craziness is doing things the same way you've always done. You'll never get <laughs> you know, where you're going to go. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's true. And and that's that, that's very much on the table right now. Yeah, that's, right. That's, that's we, exactly the, the conflict we're having. Yeah, and we see it. We see it. Yeah. Um, so we're going to take a break. And when we come back, you're... Um, we're going to talk about more about this fascinating subject of human evolution uh, for a more sustainable future. And we're going to go more deeply into Epic B. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We're back on Cafe of Delights with your host, Gail West. My guest today is Dr. Jonathan Salk who is sharing with us insights from the book written with his late father, the late Dr. Jonas Salk, the inventor of the polio vaccine. The book is entitled A New Reality, Evolution for a Sustainable Future. We've been talking about living systems and how those were reflected in human systems. We've, been, we've talked about Epic A, Epic A, which according to Salk has been in place since before the Industrial Revolution. And we're moving into uh, Epic B and where society is moving and really feeling into what is the difference between Epic B and Epic A. So Jonathan, we've been talking about Epic A way more than we want to. <laughs> 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 and how um, the indigenous cultures kind of had a new a sense of um, this idea of uh, what you talk about in the book, Epic B. So let's explore that more and um, like, how is this? And we also talked about how we're in this place of disruption, uh -huh. um, this old epic to the new epic. Okay. So let's kind of move forward and, um, and move into epic. What is epic B? How does it um, relate to and where, where are we going? Because it is feels really hopeful. Okay, so the the basic idea about Epic B is that we're 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 literally changing from a world in which everything was accelerating um, to in population growth, but also all kinds of growth and all kinds of change um, in an exponential way, and we're moving into a time where we're approaching planetary limits, where growth has to slow. And eventually we'll reach a time where we're li living at a point of equilibrium. So the idea of Epic B is that very different values have to predominate in Epic B than in Epic A. So whereas in Epic A, we relied on competition and independence. In Epic B, we're looking at cooperation and interdependence rather than, rather than exploiting resources, we're looking at the concept of sustainability. Rather than working against nature, we're working with nature, and we're living in, in harmony with that. And what's interesting about Epic B is these values, these ideas are not just because 
I think they have to emerge. And I think there's still a likelihood that they will emerge, um, not just because they're right or they're morally good or they're politically correct, but because we actually need to have those in order to survive. So that the pressures of survival in our evolution, um, evolutionary pressures are in a sense forcing us into a frame of mind and a kind of society and a way of being that is very different from what it's been for the last few hundred years. But what's significant about it is it's actually not new under the sun. Mm -hmm. These are all capabilities that we've had that are part of us as human, organi human organisms. And, you know, as you put it, the indigenous, indigenous societies incorporate most many of these values into their um, into their their social, political, economic, interpersonal, and spiritual um, way of being. So there's something really very exciting about Epic B, because not like once again, not because it's right, but because it's what we what we need to do to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and I just throw in another idea here, which is this is not total ideal, totally idealistic. We as human beings have the capacity to behave in a range of ways that we can be competitive, we can be selfish, but we can also be cooperative and social. And one of the reasons we're such a successful um, species is not really because of totally because of dominance, but because of our, our ability to operate socially and our ability to operate co cooperatively. So well, you're, you're a psychiatrist. Right? Mm -hmm. Isn't there a uh, research um, that that the human being actually um, naturally has empathy, like little Absolute. children? Yeah, so absolutely. Of these things are in, part of being human. Exactly, and you know, part of being human is, is very much social bonding, cooperation. Um, uh as you say ha having empathy being able to be tuned into other people mm -hmm. these are kind of baked in to us evolutionarily right so we're we're fully capable of behaving and living in the ways that epic b demands right um it's just a matter of uh, of us getting around to it well choice it's it's choice it's interesting choice it's choice and i throw in that there's also it's it's a lot of uh, there there's early experience that i think helps people to be um operate more cohesively and more in harmony so it's choice but it's also experience that we give small children and that that is is baked into development mm -hmm. well you know i i wonder um if we think about the the fact that we are in disruption, this idea of disruption. Uh -huh. and there, so according to your, uh, it's a sigmoid curve. Sure. Yeah. That's how you say it. <laughs> yes. Yes. So then, then one would assume that actually there is something, there is a new epic that's happening. Otherwise you wouldn't have this disruption. Am I right? You're right. You're right. Um, and what, what we're faced with is is we are faced in a crisis and it's a it's a it's a truism but you know it's danger and opportunity right so um what what i think is going on in the world today that creates such tension and such discord is that faced with the uncertainty of where we're going to go in the future that there is a whole section of our planet that are saying wait we're scared we don't know what's going to work we don't know what's going to be happening. Let's go back and have our epic A values. Let's go back to the values of the past, past 100 years. And then there's another set of people who are saying, no, we need to evolve into a new and different way of being in this totally different epic, in this totally different future where we're facing limits rather than, than unlimited growth. And there's a tension between the two. And I think that's why you see such polarities at this point. What is helpful, I think, is to be able to stand back as you can with the curve and take a long view. And if you take a long view of hundreds or thousands of years, then we can really see that not only is this um, not only is this a, just a time of confusion and terrible conflict, but that there's a way out. 
that there's, there's a way that we can adapt and there's a way we can be in the future that is different from our more recent past. Mm -hmm. Well, typically, you know, a lot of people have difficulty with change. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And, um, and there's a lot of anxiety that comes with change. There's a lot of anxiety that comes with not knowing, mm -hmm. which is kind of where people are at. And um, like, how do people navigate this? So what we're talking about is, yeah, people are anxious and they're scared. And um, and then there are other people that say, wait a minute, we've, we've got to change. Mm -hmm. But how do we how do we help those that are scared to um, that are terrified? I think terrified, actually. Yeah, well, I think. I, I think the way to do it, and obviously it's difficult, but I think it's by addressing the terror. OK, I think it's by, in some sense, empathizing with what is driving these kinds of decisions mm -hmm. um, so that if we can let people know we can give up the values that we've had in the past and there's a future and that that future is better than what we've had in the past in many respects, then I think that will help swing the tide. Um, I, I also think that as the, the generationally things do proceed so that each generation is brought up in a different kind of reality in a, in a, in a, in a new situations so that younger generations understand now it's it's it is part of them that we're we have limitations and that we have to adapt and that's not been true in prior prior generations yeah so um those who are i'm calling the old farts <laughs> of which i am one of them I, and but, me too yeah right <laughs> So we grew up at a time, I'm thinking in the 50s and 60s, where there was like, you know, we can go to the moon and we exactly. can come back and we can yeah. go to Mars and we can come back. And um, and now, you know, we didn't have the Internet at the time. And the idea of, glo of, of us being global was just for many people, just a concept. Right. Right. Back then, not a whole lot of people even had a passport. Yeah. But now um, I can be on Zoom and talk to somebody, which I will, you know, after our talk in, in the UK. And mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's it's amazing. So there is kind of a new generation that's coming up with these values. Yes. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned the, the going to the moon, because one of the things that really changed in our lifetime was that image of the planet as a whole. Yes. And... There's some people that I've worked with who who um, dealt with something called the the overview effect, which is that when astronauts go into space and they see the Earth as a single entity for the first time without international boundaries, as a as a fragile living planet, many astronauts go through kind of a spiritual transformation and they come back very much changed and understanding that we have an interdependent world and it's our responsibility to take care of this planet. And that's a whole new, it's not new under the sun because the indigenous people have the same thing, but okay. it's new in the past number of centuries. Well, and, and being able to look at the earth from above is, yes. and, and yeah. see it as, as this blue, beautiful uh -huh. thing floating in the universe is, it's, it's amazing. It's hard to, hard to describe. I can imagine what it must have been like. I think Edgar, Edgar Mitchell was uh -huh. one of the one he started the uh, the Institute for Noetic Sciences because right, he right. have a spiritual experience of one. Yeah. yeah. And so um, that is really profound. So kind of going back to um, this idea of the, the new generation is is the one our hope. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But I think some of it is um, when people have hope. So a, I, when there are a lot of people who don't have hope right or scared and so when you're scared you don't have hope there isn't a vision for something different exactly and i i think what's missing in our narrative and in in the sort of the political discussions of of the day is that that nobody's offering a story a vision of how we can get out of this and where we can be nobody's imagining a future of um, 
that, that is describing and says we're basically we're going through a transition and we've got a place to go to that's actually different but better. Everybody's fighting their interest in battles um, over the next five or 10 years and not looking back and saying what's going to happen over the 15 or 20 or 100 years or, or 200 years into the future. Um, and that's one of the reasons I like this whole concept of the sigmoid curve and the transition, because it, it says we've got something that we're going toward and articulates that. And if people can understand that, I think that will help a great deal. So that's one of the things I love, love, love about your book. And I'm going to oh. leave it up for people who can't actually see it. Uh -huh. uh, is that you talk about the different ways. So, um, for example, I'm going to quote this. Changes in community relationships will also occur. Incorporating values of collaboration, cooperation, and interdependence will likely result in richer, more complex social networks in terms of mutual support, sharing of, sharing of child care, setting community goals and responding to diversity. That's really beautiful. So That's let's go beautiful. more in, excuse me. Let's go more into the vision of these different systems. So you talk about um, the, the, um, the economic systems and the, um, the healthcare and mm -hmm. how we are. So kind of give, give us a vision that we can hold on to. <laughs> uh, I'll do my best. Okay. Uh, um, let me start, let me start small, you okay. know, which is with childcare. Okay. Um, and family structure, because one of the differences between indigenous societies and Western society is the amount of time that infants and children are in physical contact with their caregivers. Um, and that I think that in indigenous societies, they're in contact as infants 70, 80, 90% of the time. Whereas in Western industrial societies, kids are in the cribs in the room by themselves um, and only in physical contact 20, 30% of the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that this makes a huge difference in how children are socialized and how they get along. And there's a, a, a sense of connection, of empathy, of bonding that comes from those early experiences. So what one of the things I envisage in the future is um, family and community systems that allow for cooperation, that, that not only allow for cooperation, but where it's it's in the system and it's in the relationships from the very beginning. Um, so how, how so as, as a you, child psychiatrist, how have mm -hmm. you noticed that that so that only thirty percent it makes a difference with people with children I, and I I think it makes a huge difference and I think it's a, in in one way of putting it it's a difference between having a temperament that is um, trusting that feels secure that that there's a sense of abundance as opposed to one that's in, insecure mm -hmm. and where there's a sense of I have to look out for myself right. so I think that those basic societal values are part of that early experience and then are reinforced over time. Um, so that we've got right now a whole society that's built on a sense of mistrust, a sense of isolation, a sense of fear. Mm -hmm. Whereas we whereas we need to be in a in a in a society where there's a sense of 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 trust, of companionship, of emotional and material security. Now if we um I'm sorry, were you gonna ask a question? Yeah. Okay. So one of the one of the ways that I think about this is that all of these systems are interconnected. So if we have a world where there's going to be security, that means a very different kind of economic system that's that's based on exchange and that's based on um valuing not growth and not valuing material acquisition, but valuing the the, the betterment of humankind and the health of the planet and the health of people. So that we need um, to have economic and political systems in part where there's less, less um, um, imbalance in the distribution of wealth. And so that, so that there's well-being kind of throughout the society and throughout the world. You know, um, 
the origin of the word wealth is well-being. Uh -huh. And so people don't, so if you think about what is a collaborative and generous society? Exactly, exactly. So a, a generous and collaborative society is one that is wealthy for all. Mm -hmm. For all. And, and so, and, and if we go back to what we had talked about, that our brain is naturally connected and bonded with all. Uh -huh. we, we've gotten disconnected from from kind of our essence as human beings. That's right. That's right. And um, and what is at stake is is retrieving some of that and coming back to a place where where we are connected with our essence as human beings, mm -hmm. connected with other human beings, and connected with the planet. Mm -hmm. And um, all of those things. I think are possible, but it, it 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 means that we're living in communities and we're living in systems where a basic value has changed, and it's about the well-being of all, not right. the well-being of a few, at the expense of. Inherent in where we've been has been in mutual exploitation of resources and exploitation of of human other human beings. In an interdependent world, the well-being of people in distant parts of the world or in different parts of society actually accrue to our own well-being so that we're taking care of others but we're taking care of ourselves at the same time well you know i was thinking about um the idea of that we we know about things in real time so for example turkey mm -hmm. what's happening there and um how almost forty thousand people have died in the and that there's an out outpouring of generosity to the people where we in the past we wouldn't have that connection right. to the right. world and right. so more and more we're recognizing that what happens here affects us exactly exactly and recognizing that um, our global economy is a global economy what happens one place affects everybody else yes yes so we can uh, an example, excuse me, an example of that is the um, the supply chain thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like, hello, how come there's a supply chain? It's because those people over there didn't do that. And those people over there didn't do that. And now we we can't make a car and blah, 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 blah. Right, right, right. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to look at it. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. Um, and included in that is very much... Um, what, well, there's several things that are wrapped up in that, which I'll just mention briefly, but, but one is that, um, this, the supply chain benefits whom and, and where, and, and if it's benefiting the well-being of people and the well-being of planet, it's one thing. And if it's a benefiting just the, 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 the very few, it's another, mm -hmm. um, and you know we can come back to it, but it gets in the whole idea of regenerative economies and how re reducing waste and 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 um, you know rather than exploiting and discarding things, um, being able to reuse and regenerate energy and material goods. Mm -hmm. um, is it uh, David? Um... Forget the guy that wrote Drawdown. You do. No, I'm not familiar with it. Sorry. Um, so he talks about. I think it's. Uh, I don't remember. So he talks about how we can reverse climate change. We uh -huh. have to. There's all these different ways. We have one of one of the big ways is is educating women. Yes. And yes. Regener <laughs> and regenerative farming. Uh huh. Right. And and a sustainable uh, agriculture. Uh huh. Um. And they're all connected. They're all interconnected. All of those. Yes. <laughs> it's not just one or the other. It's it's a collaborative world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're going to take a break. And mm -hmm. when we come back, we're going to talk more about this epic B and what we can do as human beings individually and collectively to make the change. Um, so we'll be back in a moment. And thank you very much. And I'm talking with Dr. Jonathan Salk.
Hello, we're back on Cafe of Delights with your host, Gail West. I have Dr. Jonathan Salk. We've been talking about the difference between the current system, which Dr. Salk talks, calls Epic A, and the system which is possible, which is called Epic B. Um, before we begin, how do people contact you, uh, Jonathan, and how can they buy your book? Um, I think the simplest, most efficient, and probably most Financially, the cheapest way to buy the book is, is online through um, Amazon or through other booksellers. Um, that's the most the most efficient. There is a website that's called a new a new reality um, And there's more information there uh, about the book. And um, it, it can be ordered through the through the website as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's clear that the process has begun. Um, we're moving out of Epic A. We've got the disruption. We're moving into Epic B. We, mm -hmm. um, we can see all around us this greater conflict and disruption. So what can we hope for and how can each of us individually and in our communities facilitate the change to Epic B? Um, that's... You know, that's always a great question. And, <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> yes. Um, and I'll preface it by saying what's what's significant ab about this change it, it, is that it involves everything. It involves, as I mentioned, child care, but it involves families. It involves community, how we set up our community. It involves the design of buildings so that we can have more, um, more, intertwined and interrelated families and communities. It involves work, how we're going to uh, approach work, um, whether children can be with their parents through much more of the day than they are, so we don't have things all separate, that uh, um, allowing for maternal and paternal leave. But it also it, it 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 operates at those levels, but it also operates at the level of social, economic, and political systems. You know, and as we've touched on, we need political systems that are not based on mutual exploitation, but are that are based on mutual benefit. We need political systems that look at a global world and can solve problems, taking into account, say, the problems of the global south with the global north, and it involves our whole relationship to the planet and ecologically. So that if we're looking at making this transition, we can make contributions at any one of those levels. Um, so that um, I, you know, individually, I think it really is in, it is probably most, um, most important to, well, in a sense, Gail, I think it's most important to have hope and to have some trust in the human organism and, and in, in, in us as human beings. Um, it matters a great deal how we raise our children and it matters a great deal how we treat each other within communities. But um, I think bringing awareness, not only of climate change, but of the, the necessity for us, let's say, to be sensitive to, to be responsible for, to be accountable for, people in distant parts of the world in the global south. Um, so we can you can make a contribution at every level. There are those who it's just going to be a, a locally in their community level um, in what they do, but um, there are those who will make contributions in terms of designing new systems, of figuring out innovative ways that, that we can incorporate indigenous values into our modern technology. Um, so uh, you know, there are those who, who are involved in politics. But I think the the most important thing really is incorporating an understanding, both the long view and that and that that there 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 are ways out of this that involve changes at every level of, of human society. Well, it feels overwhelming. It it is. It feels overwhelming because it is overwhelming. Yeah. I think, I think. But I think one one of the things you're talking about is number one, it's important to have hope, mm -hmm. and to have a vision of what is possible. Mm -hmm. 
And so that's why I really, really encourage everyone to buy your book because you do go into um, the healthcare system, what is possible, the human human relations and mm -hmm. designs and um, agriculture and regenerative mm -hmm. systems. And um, the more we say, what can I what can I do individually to change to change in my day to day life? How do I treat other people? How do I care for other people? Um, and I think, um, you know, our thoughts are powerful. And the more that mm -hmm. we hold the thoughts of, oh my God, it's, it's going to hell in the handbasket, mm -hmm. it will. And the more yeah. that we hold uh, a vision of hope, that's going to change too. And so yeah. recognizing that we are creative beings, where we created all these things. And so right. we can create something else. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's, that's very much true. And I, th I think that the idea of creativity is essential to this, mm -hmm. that we're in a position where we can design the future. We're in a position where we can um, create uh, more, create a world in some sense that is more in line with not only our highest aspirations, but with our survival. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to be realistic in that these things won't happen without some degree of struggle. At least there won't, that, that we do need to stand up for and um, be true to the values that we know will help us survive into the future. But coming back to something you mentioned earlier, with, is we need desperately to have empathy and understanding for those who are against us. Mm -hmm. And and not to not to in some sense to demonize one another right. but to understand that we're all human beings just trying to survive mm -hmm. so one of the quotes i have on my um on my um, email is that we are not a bad world but a good world in the process of becoming <laughs> right no i saw that so if we look at that um that and that is about hope and it is so would you recommend um are there organizations that people can be involved in places that they can go to be with other people of like mind because it's hard to do this by yourself it, it is um you know a couple of things come to mind i you know i encourage there are um a, a couple of of there are a couple of authors that I would, would recommend that people look into. One is a, a, a woman named Kate Rayworth, who's a British economist, and she's developed a concept called donut economics. And I think there are ways of, of, of learning about and, um, and looking at um, ways to participate. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a, 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 a man named Roman Czarnik, who wrote a book called Being a Good Ancestor. And that takes also a long view and gives some prescriptions about that. Um, there's, uh, and, you know, so I, I would, would recommend them as well. There's a book called Less is More um, that also lays out some specific ways that it, the Less is More is about the concept of degrowth mm -hmm. and uh, adapting to the future. So I, I think those are places to start. Oh, um, the guy that wrote uh, uh, Drawdown also, he wrote another book, is uh -huh. Paul Hawkins. Okay, that so sounds that's, great. Uh, uh, so I don't remember the, the title of his latest book. So that's a place to start also. Um, I want to go back to this idea of population growth. And um, it, it has actually leveled out in many countries. And what's, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. And one of the things you talk about is the biggest reason for that is education of women. Yes, it's a, it's a it's an excellent point. And the the you know one of the really interesting things is that um, that in fact the population curve is showing that S shaped curve that that population growth patterns have have vastly changed and are continuing to change. And one of the real great stories in, in researching this book and learning about it is that 
that the the issue of slowing population growth is is really a win win situation, because in countries it turns out that the things that influence people to have fewer children, um, and fewer children per family, and space out their children, are improved healthcare, sustainable development, and most especially education and the the um, uh, of women. Of, and of women having some voice and some control over their reproductive lives. Mm -hmm. So um, those are all positive things that lead to the slowed growth. I think the the whole issue is a, a, the whole issue of education of women and participation of women in society is has very much to do with um, the decision to have fewer children for family. But it also um, it is a huge part of the transformation that we need to make. Right. Um, and you know, it has to do with this, the participation of women in, in the broader society. Right. Well, supposedly uh, the Dalai Lama has said, I don't know if this is true, that it is the women of the West who will bring peace to the planet. Wow. That yeah. That's, so that's, that's something and and feminine values are are more about empathy collaboration cooperation and that um and so when the integration of those things into society um will of course make a difference also yeah th that's stated perfectly that's exactly right so is there something in your book that um we haven't touched on that you want people to know about or any last thoughts? Um, yeah, I think that, that there's a, a perspective in the book that that looks at a, a broader at a, at, a, at the broad scope of human evolution. You know, looking eight thousand years into the past and eight thousand years into the future, right. and that's a, it's a striking graph because it shows that the kind of growth that we're going through now, and the kind of transition we're going through now is absolutely astronomical and it's absolutely unique in the, in human history mm -hmm. um and if you take that longer view you can see that the the history the predominant history of humanity was in what we call indigenous cultures um and that th those were the conditions in which we lived and those were the values and the way societies were organized for thousands of years what we've been living with now for the past number of hundreds of years is really an anomaly. Mm -hmm. And so that we're we're moving through that. And so this whole transition that we're going through from Epic A to Epic B is a trans is just that a transition. And where we're heading toward is a period of equilibrium in the, in the future, but at a very different level of population, technology, science, um, and economics. And what's exciting is that what we need to figure out how to do is how we can live and adapt in that future. And the answer from my point of view and from a number of other people is that we need to incorporate the um, values, the habits, the beliefs, the ways of relating that were there earlier in our, in our human evolution um, into uh, into a future world that is a, a new synthesis of our technology, our abilities, the things that have developed through Epic A and Epic B mm -hmm. with, um, with practices and values that were there um, in, a, in a prior period of evolution, of equilibrium. Yeah. And if, there, if we keep a vision of, of where we're going that will, 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 I think, make a huge difference. And I, I think that's a basic message in the book. Yeah. So there's a supposedly a prophecy in the indigenous culture, um, South American culture, that of the condor and the eagle. Have you heard this? Mm -hmm. and, they, well, go ahead. And, and the eagle is the Western world, and they've um, kind of basically destroyed the planet. But it's about thought, and the and the condor is the um, the indigenous culture, and it's about um, the heart. And so the eagle and the condor will come together and 
transform the world. That's beautiful. That's yeah. that's the same story. It's the <laughs> same story. So thank you so much, Dr. Jonathan Salk, for sharing such great information, insights, and hope. And I want to thank you all for tuning in to the Cafe of Delights. And I'd like to end with this thought. We are part of a living system. What happens in nature is reflected in the human systems. The systems we have been living with for a few hundred years are no longer sustainable. There is a new system emerging. We have a choice as to whether we're not, we want to make it happen sooner or later. Have a great week. I'll see you back here next time. Thank you for tuning in to Cafe of Delights, conversations that enlighten and inspire with me, your host, Gail West. Listen or watch live every second and fourth Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific on TransformationTalkRadio.com for a series of riveting interviews from those who are actively working at the edges of local, regional, and global transformation. From science to spirituality, culture, arts, and new economies, and more, we will explore how to create a world where all can thrive. For more information on hope for a new reality, visit me, Gail West, at successwithsoul.com.